you know, we've kind of hit all the markets that there are to be hit. You can't, we, the, the growth from signing on a new distributor in a new market is sort of is limited because we've got more now within reason. There's only a couple of continents we're not present in. One's Antarctica and the other one's Africa. And uh, their price expectation is well south of, of what we can achieve, um, financially viably anyway. So uh, we'll just let that one mature. So I guess, you know, to answer your question, I don't want to do too much. I want to, I want to work with um, our very, very good team and help them maximise their performance within our, within our group. This is the Ryan Marketing Show, and you're listening to episode 68 of 100. Today on the show, Nigel Avery, and we're out in the Bridge Par Triangle, one of the best places to grow Bordeaux-style grapes in New Zealand, if not the world outside of Bordeaux. And we're not just going to be talking about wine, we're going to talk about the, the business of wine. Um, I guess, first of all, Nigel, um, Great to be here and thanks for being on the show. You're welcome. Good to be here too. Now, there's so many areas I could start with Cellini as a business, um, what your dad's done, uh, the operation here and, and you know what you've been doing overseas for the export markets. Um, but how about we start with some, some recent history? Because although you've been involved with the company for some time, um, your roles changed quite recently to chief executive. That's right. Um, what change has that meant for you? Uh, a good, good question. I, mean, I guess prior to returning back here in August last year, 2016, I was based in the US with my family. So probably the biggest change was being um, back then, you were basically a Lone Ranger working from a small office of just one person or from home. Uh, you could do what you wanted, when you wanted, and uh, it was very autonomous. So coming back into this environment, it's much more stimulating. I've obviously many people around. Uh, fantastic to be able to go you know, down the corridor or the hall, the next office, and chat to winemakers or production or whatever, immediate input. But then uh, also having to um, be part of many more meetings and um, ad hoc, um, I guess you could say, interruptions. So that's, that was probably the biggest uh, operational uh, change for sure. Yeah. When you came back here, it was obviously working in any type of satellite arrangement. You're, although you're further away from the heart of the business and the HQ, you're really close to what the market needs. Um, what were some of the things that you were able to bring back here from the Americas around insight into that local market? Um, I think it was um, probably more really getting to know our distributor at a very, very you know, high level um, and, and that's continued um, on since I've been back and just I guess knowing how they operate, knowing how to respond and, and the sort of information they need, uh, what format they need it uh, and it's, it's very precise to the point um, they're running around with their, their butts on fire most of the time, it's an extremely competitive environment. And if they don't react to something, they, they will just lose the opportunity. So I guess, you know, really having a heightened awareness of that and being able to, I guess, you know, jump when they, when they want is, is, is pretty important. Because this is no small winery, right? We're not talking about 1,000 or even 10,000 cases a year. This is, what, upwards of three quarters of a million cases? Yeah, it's around about that. So I guess, you know, in New Zealand terms, we're, we're quite large. Nowhere near as large as the largest. But we're certainly not boutique. But then within what we do, there's a there's a large sort of commercial um, aspect to that volume. But there's a real boutique volume as well. And uh, I guess that is sort of credits to our winemakers to have the ability to you know, look at something from more of a you know where does it stand in the commercial sense to hey I want to make some a really really cool wine and they do both very very well. So we're extremely fortunate to be here, particularly in Hawke's Bay, because it just gives us an avenue to explore many different varietals and sub-regions, and you mentioned the Bridge Bar Triangle, and that's certainly something that uh, we're, we're pretty proud of being part of. I've noticed that with the wine styles that, yes, you've got the Sauvignon Blancs and the Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, as well as your Reds, 
Uh, but then there was the style that came out called cut cane, yeah. uh, where they just left the grapes on a little bit longer, mm -hmm. they got a bit sweeter, and um, you know, fascinating to see that from what is a, a larger than a, a boutique winery. How do you get the balance right between knowing what varieties and, and um, giving the winemaker enough latitude to express what they want to do versus what you know the market needs in America's next year in volume uh, and in style? Yeah, it's a little bit of an arm wrestle between uh, finance and, and production, um, but I think there's always a, a certain amount of freedom for them to experiment and do what do some things that are pretty cool. We don't overcook things and, and make massive volumes of these things because you don't know how it's, it's going to go. So some really nice, um, innovative, um, I guess, varietals. Um, Albrino uh, is one of them. Uh, the cut cane is an example of using existing plantings, but just modifying the way we manage the vineyard. Uh, and there's other different winemaking techniques that um, our guys are sort of, I guess, experimenting with. Um, but certainly Sauvignon Blanc from Marlborough, Pinot Noir from the Hawke's Bay, they are the two lead varietals for us from a volume standpoint. And, and that's not going to go away anytime soon. So these newer um, experimentations are really more for a cellar door, um, on-premise, New Zealand-based. Um, but then we've had some interest from overseas as well, so we're going to just do some one-off kind of small exports of those sort of special wines. So with those types of um, being able to experiment for the local market and you know kind of start to lead the way internationally with some of those different varieties, um, where are different palettes at around the world and how do they sit with the you know, the New Zealand consumer and how our palettes have evolved since Cellini uh, has been around over the last 20 years? Yeah, it's a good question and it's, it's very much market specific or even different areas within the market. Uh, so for example, I was based in the Midwest uh, in the USA, um, uh, wonderful place in the world, um, and, you, know, you know, great people and, and all that we learned in a, a pretty cool little place. But there, I guess the trends, I guess, flow from the west and east coast towards the Midwest. So they're kind of a couple of years behind and trend and, and things like that. But I think at the end, if you look at it from a point of even a greater scale, you've got the old world wine growing countries, which you've got incredible appreciation and understanding of wine. And then the new world, or the, I guess the, the new, new to, newer to wine country. So, you know, we'd be classified along with um, Australia, the USA, uh, to a lesser degree, um, UK, because um, they're being so much closer to those old world countries. And so, yeah, the tastes change and, and it kind of, it, it sort of follows a, uh, I guess, a pathway of, you know, our parents, you know, growing up, you know, and their understanding of wine was like, hey, well, do you want, you know, red or white? Then it was like, well, okay, I want white, but do I want a sweet or a dry? That's right. And then it evolved to, well, which varietal would you like? And then it's, okay, well, which appellation would you like or vintage? And so you start to drill down and then, uh, and it's then, I guess, to go away from, hey, I'm a Sauvignon Blanc or I'm a Chardonnay drinker to what are we having tonight? Or oh, what, what could go well with that? And so that's the sort of, the sort of pathway I see. So New Zealand is quite a way down that, which is fantastic because they're experimenting with lots of different varietals and different situations. But then you take Asia, for example, and you know a lot of talk about China and, and you know when they finally switch on to really appreciating wines, no one in the world will have enough for them, <laughs> which would be an interesting problem to challenge to have. But then if you look at Japan, as I guess the first to embrace wine, they've still got very very low per capita consumption um, and. and uh, I think it's, I guess they probably have the most advanced wine appreciation uh, as a as a, a market in, in Asia, and anybody else is is sort of further behind. So it'll never be, I don't think, um, accepted as widely as it is in the old world or the I guess the the newer wine consuming countries. Which segues nicely into your dad's story because a lot of his appreciation for wine came from. Uh, the times where he was traveling around the world for Edis International for his medical publishing uh, yep. company. Um, and it's obviously had such an effect on him that he's wanted to contribute to that with some of the, the new world styles. Uh, now, obviously, with you taking over from the CEO, CEO role and Sir Graham going into the presidency uh, role for the organization, what then, how do you get that balance right between the amazing things that he's created over his tenure in the business 
uh, with what you want to inject with some of the, the skills and credibility and international market knowledge that you've gained um, since joining Selene? Yeah, good question. I guess initially, um, you know, a friend of mine said, just after we got back, oh, what are you going to do in your first 100 days? You know, that's the CEO thing. And, uh, and I guess my response to that was not, not too much. Um, I, I kind of didn't want to be seen to be rocking any boats. Um, it's kind of the whole, if it's not broken, don't fix it type thing. So there's a bit of that. Having said that, um, you know, I am keen to, you know, to sort of look at some of the operational things here and um, very keen on a sustainable, continual improvement um, in every area that we operate in. Uh, whereas Dad was very much a, hey, here's the job, get on and do it. Um, and I'm, I guess, in that sort of way as well, but I've maybe put a little bit more structure around things. So, uh, but obviously without inhibiting people's freedom and flexibility to express themselves and, and do things. And I think uh, as far as the, the export development side goes, I, I suppose Dad was an amazing um, trailblazer and could just keep on knocking on doors and just an incredible, you know, what he has done. Uh, and if you think, um, before I came on in 2008 to help out with our Asia business, there was him and uh, another person on site covering the world Is from that New right? Zealand. That's it. Yeah, so an incredible amount of travel, and uh, which didn't go unnoticed um, in the market. So I guess it's to continue those relationships and really, really key account management, focus on um, the 80-20 rule, those those kind of things, make sure we're you know, touching the right um, organisations in the right amount of times. And, and I guess um, it, it needs to change slightly because you know, we've kind of hit all the markets that there are to be hit. You can't, we, the, the growth from signing on a new distributor in a new market is sort of is limited because we've got more now within reason. There's only a couple of continents we're not present in. One's Antarctica and the other one's Africa. And uh, their price expectation is well south of, of what we can achieve, um, financially viably anyway. So uh, we'll just let that one mature. So I guess, you know, to answer your question, I don't want to do too much. I want to, I want to work with um, our very, very good team and help them maximise their performance within our, within our group. On the marketing side of things, when you do have a market presence in all of those different countries, which I think is you know, 84, 85 different countries now, what do you then do either with the branding or uh, market awareness or your partnerships in country to then get that pull through? Because you, you can't just add countries anymore. Now you've got to add depth within a country. That, that's exactly right. And the challenge for us is, is we, we sell FOB ex New Zealand uh, in most cases. And so therefore, um, as ownership of that uh, stock passes to the importer or distributor, then it's, it's their job, I guess, to to manage the, the branding and, and all that. So for us um, to then intervene too much is, is difficult. Um, and so we really have to sort of work with them um, and encourage them to create a plan um, and to help resource that if, if we don't think it's enough for the development of the brand. And so really it's about you know, visiting frequently, um, keeping up communication and providing or keeping on providing a, a really uh, incredibly tasting um, wine that over delivers for the price we charge them. So then they can then pass that on to their customers, making some good money as well. Uh, but ultimately the consumer, when they try that wine, they go, well, that was worth what I paid. Uh, I'm going to drink it again. And hopefully they tell their friends. Now, I've seen some of the, um, the YouTube clips. You're certainly not afraid of getting in front of the, the camera and putting yourself out there. I, <laughs> I saw something, I think, on American News. I'm not sure which channel oh, yeah. it was. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, where you know you're showing the Cellini brand to you know what looks like a, a pretty large audience there, um, is you know, what are the channels that, that kind of work into different countries uh, when you want to support those um, in-country distributors? I guess it all, it all varies, and I suppose I had, you know some success in, in the US because I was living there and could respond to, to things. Um, uh, but I guess you know to do full on on PR campaign takes a lot of time and money and uh, that was kind of we're just dipping our toe in the water and we kind of got lucky with a few a few local regional networks um, but it was uh, it was a good experiment and it showed that probably more to our distributor or importer and distributors there that hey 
some ladies are already behind this, they want to help, and it just created more awareness in their internal teams. And it's, yeah, I guess, a heightened level of, of thought about Cellini, so that they're therefore, therefore go and want to sell it. It's, um, it's great when you get those moments, sometimes they're just serendipity based where there's a bit of luck and you get some of that, that mass coverage that shows credibility to an audience that will see it because of the, the channel that you've been um, presented on. Yeah. Um, now, wine hasn't always been your thing. Uh, your background is quite illustrious in the sports side of things. I uh, saw that you have um, competed in the Olympics uh, and won medals for Commonwealth Games, both a, a silver and a gold. What are some of the lessons that you were taught through sport that you are bringing into your role as CEO here? Yeah, it's a good question, and there's, there's huge parallels between um, developing potential in sport uh, to business and vice versa. Um, and, uh, and I guess the, some of the key things are pretty fundamental, really, in, in both things. Is one is, is I guess, um, having a plan. In, in the case of sport, it's a training plan and, and periodization and um, setting goals and targets and objectives to perform uh, at your best at a certain point in time. And so that's... Uh, pretty easily understandable that you you transfer that as well. Um, in sport, it was all about you know, me trying to put the best people around me as I could to help me achieve those goals and targets. Uh, obviously, coach, um, you know, sports psych, nutrition, physio, chiropractic, all those sort of things, and, and uh, that kind of no stone unturned type type approach. And, and I guess that's what I like to, uh, you know, once again, it's an easily, uh, concept you can easily transfer into a business environment. And, and that's what, how I see our team. Um, it's, you know, we want to get the best people here. If um, we don't think they're the best, then the goal is to say, hey, how can we improve that? Because I guess, as I said before, you know, sustainable continual improvement across all areas of our business includes our, our staff and team. And so you know, that's one of the things I'd like to you know, embark on in the next sort of 12 or 18, 24 months is a, a planned approach to say, hey, look, how can we maximize everybody's individual performance? On a step-by-step, -step, you know, sustainable basis that overall in the whole will will increase the capability here, and uh, and and hopefully no doubt profitability. So that's really exciting if you're a, a uh, employee or a member of the Cellini team because what you've seen through your experience in sport and having great people around you took you to the heights of you know, what you were capable of. So for those people in the team now that are here, there's a really exciting journey coming up for them challenging at times, it will push them, but they'll certainly grow through it. Well, I'd like to think so. I mean, hopefully um, people take it in the spirit, that's, which is intended, and that is to, to improve everybody and everything. And, and uh, if people grow, then that's uh, only a good thing. Um, I guess, you know, we are a relatively lean company from a personnel point of view. And the challenge challenges there is that the, the scope for growth within the organisation is, is a challenge. So, you know, we'll just have to you know, cross that bridge when we get to it, I guess. Uh, you were the first um, medaled athlete that I've interviewed on the show. Um, and a question I've always wanted to ask is, you know, four years is a long period of time to train for a moment. And that moment is so short, you know, it can be just a few seconds or a couple of minutes. What did you do to get your mindset right on that day in those few minutes as you're about to you know, start the race? How do you get into that right zone to give it your all in a physiological, mental, spiritual, emotional way? Yeah, it's a good question because, you know, um, you take the 100 metres as an example, you know, the, the breaking rule now, if you break, that's it, you're gone. There's no, First there's no second chance anymore. No way. It used to be, you used to get one break each, then there was one break per race, and now it's if you break, you're done. So in some cases, that's, it's all over. Um, but I guess to answer your, your, your specific question, and it is a, and it's an incredible moment and and you know the level of anxiety is huge because it's that whole what if but that's the what if you're going to try and you know what if i don't achieve what i want and that's what you got to try and get it out and you do it by practice so you play i used to play mental games uh, in training around okay this is it this is the one i have to get this lift and sort of put self pressure on myself um, in training um, to try and replicate what is bound to happen in a competition event and you know, I saw a lot of um, a lot of my training partners would do amazingly 
things in the gym and training, but not be able to transfer that into the wow. competition platform. And, um, you know, I don't know why I didn't really quiz them too hard on it, you know, but um, yeah, I think for me it was all about, you know, you train, make training very difficult so that the competition is, is easier. And so that's kind of how I approached it. And I suppose, you know, that isn't doing a heck of a lot of hard work so that um, it makes it easier. And, and for my business side, it's, it's no different, just well prepared, hard work. And then, you know, I don't know, remember who said it, but, you know, the harder you work, it, the luckier you seem to get. That was one of my father's favourite sayings mm. over, over his time. And I think a lot of Hawke's Bay businesses, particularly in the wine industry, do look up to Cellini for what Cellini has achieved and for what your father has achieved. Uh, what advice would you give to those wineries that are in their you know, first five or ten years, knowing what you know now about um, you know, how much your volume and how you've, you've grown the business? Um, what things do you think that they should be focusing on now to end up in a position where they could be as big as Cellini in 15 years? Well, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think one of the things that, that we kind of um, are trying to remedy now is we kind of outgrew our systems. Um, and you know, I think we've got some pretty good at, you know, you know, knowledge um, that floats around the place, but it's not all in, in a cohesive thing and, and I think with growth we kind of just outgrew it so I think it's it's kind of all-encompassing um, and, and I think you know step by step is a is a pretty good approach we've made some pretty big pretty big jumps at some point and uh, you know it's you know to dad's credit but that put a lot, puts a lot of pressure on things so um, I think you know you've got to get out in the market uh, every time I get out there something happens without question and uh, you know, sitting here in, in Hawke's Bay, a wonderful place to eat your lunch, make some wine, but um, you, you know, it's a big world out there and you've got to get in amongst it. So that, that's really the, the key from a, from a sales point of view, I believe. Great advice. I still get on that plane, go and meet people, have dinners, shake hands and talk and taste the wine. Yeah, yeah. and I, I guess fundamentally, uh, you've got to keep making great wine, but it's such an amazing, amazing collegial environment viticulture winemaking um, not only here in the Hawke's Bay but generally around New Zealand and just our wines are it's just getting better and better and better it's just awesome and uh, we've already got a fantastic reputation globally uh, we need to transfer that recognition from solely Sauvignon Blanc which tends to be in most countries to say hey look we do some other riders amazingly well and hopefully that can sort of kick on and we are really blessed here in the Hawke's Bay as I said with incredible sort of microclimates, different regional um, sort of differences that, that can make some incredible wine. I believe you're onto something with that. I think that with the, the New Zealand wine industry is collegial and there is sharing of knowledge and that overall that's helping uh, our brand internationally and helping learn from each other in a way that's much quicker than maybe some other countries in their winemaking. Yeah, well, I think, you know, we're very small. We're never, ever going to dominate the world in wine. I mean, in, in Sauvignon Blanc, we, we, we do that because of, you know, it is just so unique. But we produce less than 1% of the world's wine. Uh, none of our companies are big enough to tell the New Zealand story. You know, we, we don't have that whatever. I mean, even the, the brands that are owned by some of the biggest wine companies can't really tell that story either because there are just so many wine brands. So... You know, we always talk about New Zealand, we always talk about Hawke's Bay and Marlborough, then we start talking about Cellini and our part in that. And so I, I'd, I'd like to think that all the other wine producers, when they're representing themselves globally, also do that. Because um, the more we can talk about New Zealand in general, create some general noise about that, you know, the better it is for everybody. So that's kind of, kind of how we think about it. Excellent. Uh, one last question. Uh, last year was the Hawke's Bay Marathon, the inaugural one and it finished at Cellini so yeah. for the first time we had some some people um, almost crawling to get into Cellini <laughs> to, to get over there the finish line uh, will you be competing in the marathon this year I will not be competing in it if I do anything it'll be walking 10k <laughs> my joints are certainly not uh, the right uh, the right condition for that <laughs> but yeah amazing event and uh, it was an incredible day unfortunately I was still overseas didn't make it but huge amount of positivity came from that um, and they're the events that you know the bay should really get it behind you know, a large number of visitors you know you know it sort of goes with the, the sort of the healthy lifestyle of the bay the, the fresh produce the yeah. you know consumption of wine in a, in a, in a responsible way 
uh, and, and being active and healthy? It was, um, I did the half marathon, so yeah. only the, the, the second half of the pain. And to run through the vineyards, through the vines of areas that um, you know, I've grown up in, in Hawke's mm. Bay, but to see all these different vistas for the first time uh, down by the river, you know, going through the 6, 7K mark, it was spectacular. So mm. for anyone wanting to um, see some different views, it's, it's worth doing a little bit of training for. Yeah, it's a great advertisement for the Bay. I mean, you mentioned the ages before we had a, a reunion here for that over the weekend and uh, many people had first time to the Bay. A few people were saying, hey, I think we might be moving here. One who had just recently. So uh, I guess we don't want to tell too many people. I keep a little bit of a secret about how special the place is. But uh, yeah, you're right. Just seeing things from different eyes is, uh, is sometimes a good thing. Uh, Nigel, I really appreciated talking with you today and for you sharing your own personal story and the story of Selene. And you know, we touched on uh, Sir Graham Avery's story as well there. Um, what a great heritage to continue. And it looks like you've got some amazing plans for the team here and for your export market. So I wish you all the luck in the future. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Nigel. If you like this episode, remember to subscribe for free on iTunes. Simply search for The Ryan Marketing Show in the iTunes Store.